long has it been now since you've had your last treatment for? Um, it's been almost, it'll be eight years in September. Eight so. years. And you went through a lot of recurrences, didn't you? Yeah. I um, was originally diagnosed in 97, so I went through six months of chemo. I was in remission for two months, then it came back, and then I did uh, the auto bone marrow transplant. And then I was in remission for two years, and it came back again. And then I did chemo for six months, and then this frozen tissue is first removed from liquid nitrogen, tissue that was frozen 11 years ago before this patient had her multiple rounds of chemotherapy and bone marrow transplantation for a seemingly hopeless case of Hodgkin's from which she turns out to be cured. After the thaw of the tissue is complete, then we'll prepare it for transplanting back to the patient. It is critical that the tissue be thinned down to a bare three-quarter millimeter or even a half millimeter thickness so as to get the least amount of ischemic damage from the most rapid revascularization possible. This has to be treated just like a skin graft in the sense that the thinner the graft, the less there's going to be any ischemic damage. So we spent a great deal of time under the operating microscope, not just with the bare eyes, but actually under high magnification, because that's the only way we can really be certain that we removed all of that extra fibrous tissue that will get in the way of rapid revascularization of the thin outer half a millimeter cortex where all of the primordial follicles are located. So here you see us taking each one of the multiple strips that we had frozen individually in a cryovile, each one of them, and thinning them down one by one in Leibowitz media under ice cold saline or media so that we have absolutely the most perfect strips available for transplantation. We turn the tissue over to make absolutely certain that it is at its very thinnest and then go on to the next strip and continue to thin each strip out until each one of these strips is probably ready finally for the transplantation. We cut off the rough edges that don't have any eggs in them so that all we're dealing with is pure cortical tissue uh, filled with primordial follicles. Again, we turn another piece of tissue over to check the thinness to make sure it's absolutely translucent. And then we quilt the multiple strips together on the operating microscope on the bench before we ever think of doing the grafting back to the patient. So under the operating microscope using 90 nylon interrupted sutures one by one we take these individual strips and we quilt them together so they'll be the right size to finally be able to put on the ovarian cortex. We don't want to just be suturing these strips in separately because it will be a real mess and they'll be slipping all over and you'll destroy the main principle of getting rapid revascularization, which is to have perfect approximation of the tissue bed to the receptacle bed. And this can be accomplished by first quilting together all of these strips. So what we have is just one solid piece of tissue that can be grafted onto the ovarian medulla. The frozen ovary of most patients will contain 10 to 15 strips, and they have to be individually frozen in a cryovile unless one uses vitrification. However, this procedure performed 11 years ago when this patient was only 20 years old was before we had knowledge of vitrification of ovarian tissue, and so they were frozen individually in cryovials. These small strips then must be put together before grafting onto the patient, and we normally will have the opportunity to do three or four grafts with about five strips per ovary to transplant back to the patient. The quilting is now complete, and we are ready to take this beautifully approximated piece of ovarian cortex back to the patient and put it onto the recipient cortex. We open the abdomen first with a mini laparotomy and get beautiful retraction with a Mobius retractor so that it's a very minimally invasive procedure which can be performed as an outpatient because the incision is so small. 
Here we have the dead ovary, that is the cortex that's been destroyed by uh, 11 years of chemotherapy and radiation. And we're cutting this scarred cortex uh, completely off of the medulla to get to good bleeding. Of course, histologically, we check the cortex afterwards uh, to see whether there are any residual follicles. And sometimes there are occasional residual follicles. So the only way you can even be sure that the pregnancy occurred as a result of the ovarian graft is if you've actually truly removed the residual cortex, the so-called dead cortex, in preparation for then transplanting the thawed tissue, which has many healthy primordial follicles, not just one or two, onto the cut surface of the medulla. Here we're sizing our quilted piece of cortex that has been thawed. Again, it is amazing to think that we are actually suturing a ovarian cortex from a 20-year-old woman back onto her 11 years later when she is 31 years of age. And these will be eggs that have not aged beyond that of a young 20-year-old. And so we would anticipate very high pregnancy rates uh, with thawing and transplanting back this kind of tissue. But the critical factor in making sure we have a high success, as you can see here, is to make sure with these multiple interrupted sutures of 90 nylon that we have perfect approximation of this cortex to the medullary bed. We also have to have pinpoint microbipolar hemostasis to make sure that we have minimal risks of microhematoma forming underneath the graft. Any plastic surgeon will tell you that microhematoma formation under the graft will cause that portion of the graft to necrose because of delayed revascularization. So not only do we have to make sure that we suture the edges of the cortical graft properly to the medulla, but even the inside of the cortical graft has to be sutured down to the medulla so that we get these stay sutures that give tight approximation and by that virtue of that pressure, we're able to prevent microhematoma formation. Not only the pinpoint microhemostasis, but also having a pressure bed that can prevent any kind of accumulation of the tiniest amount of serum or blood underneath the graft is crucial for early revascularization. Finally, we make sure that while we're doing all this, there is continual pulsatile irrigation with heparinized saline so that we don't get any possibility of adhesion formation that would interfere with ovum pickup. So our very high success rate is related to a number of very, very specific surgical procedures and techniques. Number one, the graft has to be super thin. Number two, we have to get perfect hemostasis of the medullary bed. Number three, we have to continually irrigate with heparinized saline to avoid adhesions. Number four, we must get tight approximation of that thin graft to the ovarian medulla so as to avoid accumulation of microhematomata. The mini lap incision is very small, and the patient can go home that evening or the next morning. How did you feel after surgery? I, I mean, I felt really good. Yeah. And, um... I just thought I'd be better off at home, right? Just, <laughs> and, and you just yeah. left yeah. the next morning. So they just tell me what I need to do to get out of there. They said, eat breakfast, walk the hallway, and then you're out the door. And I said, okay. So before my uh, nurse came in, I was like, she was walking down the hallway with the multivitamin. I'm like, hey, give me that. I'm out I'm, the door. You I'm know? gone. I'm gone. Forgetting about the cancer, we have a, a method for continuing to, to make pregnancy very easy because you still got a 20-year-old ovary. It's, you got it on right now. When it runs out, you got more 20-year-old ovaries basically in the freezer. Mm -hmm.